Hi, everyone. Welcome to Artifact number 53. I am joined today by Keith Jackowitz. Uh, I've been trying to uh, practice pronouncing his name because for 15 years I've been mispronouncing it. So it's, it's a, a very new situation for me. And as you can tell uh, with the angles that he got going on in the new kind of um, little uh, setup here, uh, we look about the same height. And today we're going to be talking about, speaking of illusions, we're going to be talking about William Shakespeare's play, The Tempest. And I mean, there's a lot of stuff in the ether, right? There's decolonization, part of uh, uh, the, the public discussion now, colonialism. And this play fits very nicely in uh, some of those uh, categories of, I guess, literary criticism or just political thought. And The Tempest is a play, I mean, I, I first read it, uh, I guess, when I was maybe in middle school or high school, one of those things that you read for high school. Mm -hmm. I read it again in college. And I'm not sure uh, what you think, Keith, in terms of like rereading it now, but I was a little bit uh, less impressed by it now than I was in former times. I guess kind of like my mind really kind of built it up a little bit with, um, you know, I, I had forgotten, for instance, that Caliban only has just a couple of like extended, you know, monologues or, I mean, in, in the play, they're more dialogues or whatever. He's responding to people, but uh, there's not really that much right if you go by a purely line by line basis compared to some of uh, shakespeare's best plays but it is a play that is very mysterious i think in many ways uh there's definitely enough there uh that if you just kind of contextualize it right and you think about well you know four or five centuries ago um what kind of thought existed in terms of you know colonial theory or whatnot how did people think about you know uh, uh categories of people or uh, race or whatnot and there's a lot there uh, to discuss and you know no uh, no character in many respects except perhaps uh, maybe miranda and uh ferdinand come out unscathed right everybody is just kind of pilloried in, in many respects uh which is another kind of interesting way of doing things um i think it's very easy right to to create characters that are just uh, either too perfect or too villainous but there's a lot of in-between states. So maybe we could start off with kind of your impre impressions of the text. Maybe we could just start specifically with like, you know, as uh, as artists, right? From a writerly perspective, how, how, like how do you how do you deal with this? How, how, how good is it compared to, um, you know, either modern plays or, or things uh, within William Shakespeare's canon? You know, it's interesting. I always had this in the upper tier of Shakespeare plays in my memory. I I went through, it's funny, I'm a very lazy person in a lot of ways, you know, and I'm horrible about procrastinating, but I get into these periods where I'm just constantly, constantly, constantly on something. So I went through the entire corpus of Shakespeare's plays in about a month in college, uh, just like constantly reading them, uh, you know, going back again over certain passages. And I remember at that time, I, my, my gut feeling was that The Tempest was definitely one of his better play, like, uh, yeah, you know, sort of like, he has the obviously great stuff like Hamlet, Othello, Macbeth. He's got the kind of the the most of the history plays i it, my my gut feeling is not that we were, my my sense was not that they were bad but mostly just that they were kind of boring mm -hmm. uh and then most of his comedies and a few of his like really bad tragedies like uh romeo and juliet and uh titus andronicus i i had i was just like why why are we still reading this why are we still performing this i mean romeo and juliet i guess has cultural cash that makes it you know important it's been there's been so many takes on that sort of idea of star-crossed lovers okay it has cultural importance but like why is anybody reading titus andronicus or performing titus andronicus anymore this one really sucks and i had this one in the in the upper tier of shakespeare's plays and i might still put it there but definitely i would put it you know closer to the to the bottom part of that tier you mm -hmm. know like I, 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 I mean people do all these tier lists uh on youtube now like oh rating all of the fast food chains and uh culver's is s tier and taco bell is d tier or whatever so this would probably be you know if, we, if we're referring to that genre i would maybe put this more in the a rather than the s category uh for shakespeare where there's a lot of there's a lot of interesting stuff happening in it um 
there it, it's got obviously one of the more famous passages from Shakespeare, which is the we are such stuff as dreams are made of uh, monologue that happens somewhat near to the end of the play. Uh, but, you know, it's no, it's definitely not all killer, no filler. I mean, it's got uh, one, one thing Shakespeare just that just does not hold up. And this is sort of universally true that this particular genre does not hold up well over time. But I would say it's more true of Shakespeare than others is his comedy is just not good. You mm -hmm. know, he's such a he's so infatuated with his own command of the language that he really thinks that doing clever little wordplay and then just having people drinking on stage and acting like jackasses is going to just really carry, uh, you know, his comedy into the stratosphere. And I mean, I've seen funny I like I I've seen Shakespearean comedy done humorously and in a way that makes you laugh, but it is almost always diverging from like the core essence of what you know. It's almost always like much more physical kind of comedy or like people putting on funny hats and like funny accents and things like that that gets a laugh rather than the pure uh, linguistic mastery of the bard or anything like that. So I I, I mean it's there's a little bit of social commentary in it in this one uh but like most of Shakespeare's social commentary it sort of boils down to the uh stupidity and unfitness of the masses versus the aristocracy um uh the the, the thing that really strikes me is that like in some ways Shakespeare is because he predates the the enlightenment as it is typically dated you know i mean the earliest i've ever seen it put is like 1637 with uh with with Descartes uh but you know Shakespeare is kind of he he has the kind of mind that would have functioned well in the enlightenment in terms of really being interested in a lot of different things and 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 but it, he also really in a lot of ways takes for granted the like the wisdom and rightness of the order in which he existed you know it's always the i mean if the nobility if there's any problems with the nobility, it's not that they're they're stupid. It's it's that they're evil or self interested, you know. But they are always or are, are, are often you know counterbalanced by a, uh, a a smart and ethical noble somewhere else in the in the chain. You know, there is some sort of counterforce against the the perfidy of the few bad nobles uh, that ruin the good name of the rest of the nobles, you know? And I, I think Shakespeare is a pretty astute observer of that sort of late feudal, uh, early modern European political order. And I think you could probably learn a lot about it, but, you know, he just, he, re he really takes for granted a lot of the, of the system in which he was embedded and, you know, really, really does a lot to, you know, it, to flatter the the preconceptions of the more uh, educated and elite parts of his uh, potential audience, rather than than challenging it. I mean, maybe we there's some sort of Straussian reading of this by which you could glean some sort of uh, critique of the established order, but it's certainly not the not the face reading. And Shakespeare was really writing in a time before subtext literarily was much of a thing. So I, 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 I really, you, it would take a lot to justify that reading. It mostly just comes across as the, uh, the, the, uh, as the, uh, as sell, as flat, as flattery of his elite patrons more than anything else. But it's a, it's a good play. It's just, it's not as good as I remember it. Yeah. Well, one thing about it is, uh, first of all, it's, uh, I don't know if it's the shortest, but it's definitely one of the shortest yeah, uh, it, plays um and uh it, it takes place uh just like if you were to like map out in terms of time right i think uh something like um well you know like miranda you, you you've uh barely known uh ferdinand for three for three hours right so it's not like days or anything past right it's only just a few hours and i think most of the productions are anywhere between uh two hours and 15 minutes to two and a half hours so you know everything's just kind of like uh, more or less happening at once one after the other but uh, like but if you if you just sort of break apart apart the individual pieces right to get back to the idea of like well how is the writing itself like the opening scene is just you know it's the, the tempest is there right that's how um uh, alonzo's uh a ship right gets uh, shipwrecked uh because ariel the um you know the, the sprite or whatever you want to call him 
um, uh, makes it happen, right? While uh, sparing uh, all the lives on board. And like when you read that opening sequence, all, all it does is just kind of like set up the plot devices and just kind of moves, you know, moves the narrative forward, right? But in a purely kind of plot driven way, there's nothing in that opening sequence that is memorable. There, it, it has no real function other than to just like move the plot forward. And sometimes this is done in a way that's like not very memorable, such as here. But there's also other situations that I think are a little bit, you know, different and daring. Like, um, and maybe we could use this to like discuss Prospero's character and the rest of the characters specifically. But in in Act uh, Four, I believe it's Scene One, where they have that kind of like mock uh, marriage or whatever between uh, 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 between Ferdinand and Miranda. As that's happening, like Prospero is like getting more and more in his own head, right? He's like you know having the the spirits like set this thing up, and as it's happening. Uh, he's getting more and more lost in it. And then suddenly he remembers, wait, I remember there's a conspiracy against my life and I need to, you know, put a stop to it. So he, you know, essentially calls off that ritual or whatever you want to call it. And that that ritual, like it, when you like analyze it also line by line, there's really not much there. Right? Like the music there isn't very memorable. The use of like uh, the gods, gods is not like very novel. Uh, but it's one of those things where, you know, maybe the writing in and of itself isn't that good for that sequence. And yet suddenly you could, you know, maybe justify it by this, you know, by this, it's characterization, right? You justify it by characterization. You sort of have all this stuff that's moving, moving, moving. And then suddenly it only exists to essentially further characterize Prospero as this kind of, you know, absent-minded, almost professor type who wanted to be a ruler, wanted to be, um, the Duke, but uh, perhaps is not really cut out for anything other than either the magical or the philosophical life. You know, a lot of uh, criticism on the Tempest is, is focused on this idea of, uh, and this is like a time old question, right? Can a philosopher, in fact, ever be a king? And maybe we could just like start off by talking about Prospero and how his situation came to be. The way that it's described, and this is, you know, he admits to this, Prospero says, I was so kind of like lost and so fascinated by these magical arts, right? I was kind of, um, you know, uh, in my, you know, cloister somewhere, just reading, reading, reading. And so eventually, right, there's this conspiracy to overthrow him. Now, that doesn't strike me as necessarily uh, irrational or wrong. I mean, who knows what was going on at the time? They're not like referencing really like any wars or any kind of like real, you know, other kinds of usurpations or whatnot, but still, Right. The idea is like, you know, you live in a dangerous world and maybe you're not cut out to be a king. You're not cut out to be a duke. You're not cut out for power. You're just cut out to essentially be where he ends up, which is he ends up, you know, in this island. It's an island that is unnamed. And uh, it's almost kind of like a metaphor for his own mind. Right. He's he's receding further and further and further into his own head. All right. And and he in some ways maybe wishes it was uninhabited, but it's not inhabited, right? There's Caliban, there's Ariel, right? There's perhaps these other uh spirits. I don't know if they get sort of taken in by Ariel, where they get summoned or what that is, but you know, it's it's mostly unpopulated. And everything has to come to Prospero, right? Prospero is the one that is waiting, it seems, for this ship to finally come by so he could get his revenge. Um, and you know, th there's like a metaphorical quality there, right? Where uh, uh, he, you know, he, he, he's somebody that can't make things happen, right? He's not there to take the action. He's waiting for life to come at him and he's going to respond to those events. So, um, do you have anything you want to say about, about Prospero uh, as a character? Cause you know, out of everybody here, like, I wish I could say, oh, you know, Caliban is the most fascinating one or like some, you know, like second year character. Oh, like if you really, you know, listen to what this guy says, that's the most fascinating one. But really Prospero is central to the text. And I think he's he's the best uh, sketch character uh, of the play. So maybe have your thoughts on him as a character. I mean, Prospero is really the only one that really has anything to him, honestly. Yeah. I and mean, I would say he's pretty clearly the the focus of the play, you know, in terms of rationality or irrationality, I mean, you have to remember what political theory was at the time that Shakespeare was writing this, you know, the, 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 the idea of, oh, you get rid of this leader because he's not hacking it and you install somebody else. I mean, the idea that that might be 
you know, justified or a, a good action to take. I mean, that's that's very modern on our part. You know, I mean, that's not where legitimacy flowed from in the uh, in in Shakespeare's time. I mean, the the Duke of Milan as the subsidiary of the King of Naples. I mean, I guess technically the King of Naples. I I, I don't. I don't know enough about like the hierarchy of Italian city states uh, at the time to say if he would have had the absolute right to depose one duke and install another. But I I I I I tend to think he probably wouldn't have, you know, not without something happening that would like disrupt the line of secession by which the the you know by 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 which the the dukedom would have uh, fallen to to somebody else. I mean, maybe because. Prospero had a daughter. If if he goes, then it goes to his next of kin, which is his brother, uh, in in this and his brother Antonio. Um, so, I, it's, but the, the the point is that the, there's not there there's not a uh, politically legitimate way by which a Antonio could usurp Prospero uh, without something like Prospero's legitimate death that Antonio had nothing to do with you know, in Shakespeare's day. That's just not, the, 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 the idea that, you you know, that there would be some sort of good that would flow from one leader getting uh, rid of another one through irregular channels, that's, that, that, that's not something that would have been conscionable either to average people or especially to the elite patrons of Shakespeare's uh, theatrical productions in Elizabethan England. Uh, but I, I, the the reason I brought up the Enlightenment earlier is there is you know the 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 milieu that ended up producing the Enlightenment included uh, the sort of scientific investigations of say Francis Bacon and while Shakespeare missed like most of the Enlightenment probably like the early the early sort of aspects of natural science that would contribute to the Enlightenment were something that. He would have been exposed to. I think Francis Bacon died. I, I looked it up in like 1637. So there would have been some stuff along that lines that Shakespeare would have been exposed to and thinking about in terms of political theory and legitimacy. So the, the thing that I sort of take away, it's not that it's rational or irrational for uh, Antonio to uh to to overthrow prospero it's that prospero has shirked his duty as a nobleman by retreating into his studies of sort of arcane arts and magic uh and he's forgotten the the most basic tenet of like being a political leader in this time which is that it's about managing relationships it's about uh, uh building and maintaining connections between you and other elite power brokers and at the same time uh bestowing enough favor and justice and leniency on your people uh that they, they you know both poor and rich that they continue to support your being in the position that you are and the the, the this whole like the 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 feudal european political order feudal is not a favor term among scholars anymore but i'll use it for lack of a better term the the order was basically the king and local barons and dukes and things like that sort of existing in an uneasy detente with one another where theoretically the legitimacy of the lower nobility came from the their being sanctified by the king uh, but the king did not have actual uh absolute power over any of them that's a much later development and so he had to sort of come up with privileges and exemptions and and things like that in order to continually curry favor with them so i, I mean i i think of this play more as a a, a parable about the potential pitfalls that rulers can come to with this sort of, you know, th th this late Renaissance, early modern, just before the Enlightenment, flowering of arts and letters and sciences and fascination with the classical world and uh, and, and and stuff that had come to Europe after the fall of uh, Constantinople in the in the 1400s it's it's sort of like you know if you guys get too caught up in this spate of new knowledge and this belief that you can subsist purely on say gaining greater control of nature then you're going to forget the very 
uh, skills that you should be cultivating in order to continually uh, hone and reify your leadership, which is the your your treatment of and maintenance of relationships uh, uh, with other people, especially other elites. So, I mean, just just reading it, that was kind of my kind of my 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 main my main takeaway. And so, Prospero, I think, is at the same time, Prospero is the only in some ways like sympathetic and interesting character so he's not purely poo-pooing the idea of leaders uh you know taking an interest in like the philosophical and liberal arts he's more he's more just saying like th these things should be subservient to your leadership and not uh like the the crux of or the legitimating uh like the legitimating uh reason of your leadership yeah um do you notice uh so like a after the shipwreck occurs uh, because uh, prospero summons it up uh ariel then goes out and does his bidding uh miranda is then just like you know she's complaining right she she's supposed to be this i don't know uh the archetype of the kind of uh uh maiden right who is uh, perfect in many regards who's very sweet who is very uh docile on the one hand but also very you know like stands up for uh, what's righteous uh, on the other hand and she's you know she's scared about the idea that well you know somebody might have been hurt during the shipwreck so you have to uh, allay my fears here and he says don't worry about it nobody got hurt and then he starts getting into uh, the story of their origins because miranda has been on this island with him for uh 12 years so she seems to probably be something like maybe 15 16 years years old now as the play is going on and so she's spent most of her life here and she never seems to be inquisitive about the past right like he she at some point says something like uh you know uh, i yeah you, you you've started to tell these stories before but my mind uh never uh you know wanted to like inquire further and who knows why in fact that is the case but uh as he's as prosper is going deeper and deeper into his story one thing that keeps coming up and i notice this now and i didn't notice this before and perhaps there's like some you know something here worth discussing where he keeps interrupting his own story he keeps asking her are you listening dost thou attend me are you listening are you listening that's like it, it seems to be a little bit like meant to be as, as comic relief but i i think it's more than that it's almost as if prospero to kind of like get back to the idea of this like absent-minded professor type who wishes to be a ruler as well uh he sort of like understands that you know maybe he could be boring to other people and perhaps he's, he's even boring to himself but on the other hand, Miranda does not seem to be at all inattentive either to him or to the story specifically. And yet he's still like there, there's something about that where, you know, maybe if he has this kind of like tyrannical aspect to him, you know, by its nature, something like tyranny is always going to be somewhat insecure because uh, instead of like offloading, you know, your powers and, you know, stability or whatever to institutions or to, you know, the market or like some mechanism by which like people could get some kind of appeasement from, instead you have to sort of like, you know, lay down the law and this might not really work that easily. Uh, the same thing uh, also seems to be happening with Ariel. So like, uh, Ariel like is, is demanding his freedom. He's like, okay, so I did this thing with the shipwreck. But you promised me my freedom uh, a long time ago. Where is it? What's happening? And he asks him, you know, does that forget what condition I found you in? And Ariel says, no, I remember where I came from. And then Prosper says, you don't. You don't remember. And once a month, I have to have this conversation with you. So literally, he's haranguing Ariel about, you know, this. He, he seems to be in conflict with Ariel, like literally every single month, right? They can go through this like fight that eventually settles with like Ariel, you know, continuing to do whatever is asked of him, uh, which is, you know, kind of funny, but also very revealing again. You know, like my, my, I have the Norn Critical edition of The Tempest, which uh, like half of it is literally just like, you know, criticism of, you know, from different people starting from around the time of Shakespeare to the present day, you know, there's everything from like, you know, that old school type of literary theory to, you know, post-colonial studies or whatnot. And one thing that's true of like the beginning part of these uh, excerpts is how, 
you know, um, everybody does like the, the Harold of Bloom thing of like, you know, Shakespeare created the first human. These are such like very rich, rich um, uh, characters. And yet the only truly rich character is Prosper, who seems to be very human, like in all these kinds of ways where, you know, like he, he seems to be kind of aware of his own foibles. He seems to be kind of aware how others might respond to him. He knows that tyranny is a, is a kind of dead end system. And there's like so many other things that we could discuss, but um Miranda for her part uh maybe uh you uh might agree with this like she's probably one of the least interesting characters because like there is nothing but that archetype um you know it's, she just she's there to fulfill that kind of function of well if this is going to be a comedy right which tends to end with a marriage right we need to have something like that here we have like the the pure woman so um maybe respond to anything that I said or, or maybe we could talk about Miranda as a character as well uh, I mean, I, I, I agree uh, uh, with how you were talking about Prospero. The one thing I'll say is, as someone who has had to learn about acting Shakespeare, because once upon a time I wanted to be an actor before I realized I wasn't any good. But one thing I did learn is that a lot of times uh, when you come across like art thou listening, you know, you when you come across stuff like that, the point of that is, I, I mean, I, I, I do get where you're coming from where like it, it doesn't necessarily show in the text that she is being inattentive but the in early modern theatrical writing they didn't really have the the same tools of uh stage directions that we have nowadays in playwriting because actors did not get a full script they got their parts and then they got a leading line from the other person so they would know when they heard that from that person uh then that would be it would be that would be their cue to start saying that their line so a lot of times when you have stuff like that in shakespeare it is uh it is there to help cue the other actors so they know that it's time for them to start talking and also to give them uh, a sense of stage direction that the you know, other than the the big stuff like the whole group of people falls asleep or uh, exit pursued by a bear in Twelfth Night, one of the great pieces of stage uh, stage direction in theatrical history. Um, you know, you could either have her paying attention, and you could play it as like Prospero being sort of like neurotic, like "Are you listening? This is really important." Or you could allow Miranda to play it as sort of absent-minded and maybe she's sort of wandering off looking at the or she's trying to maybe see the wreck from where she is like what's going on with that like she's not paying as close of attention as she should be you know but the, the i mean the thing with miranda is i mean she clearly has more of like a symbolic function in the story as it relates to like sovereignty or whatever than uh than she does a uh you know a, a specifically character-like function because she really doesn't have a character other than just sort of being naive and being there to ask like ignorant questions about the situation situation like how did that happen what's going on how did we get kicked out uh and then also her the fact of her virginity is very very important later mm -hmm. in the play uh uh, uh specifically the it, it her virginity is paralleled against the sort of uh virginal and yet possibly somewhat barren state of the island that they find themselves on you know she is the the perfect potential queen because she is totally unsullied uh you know by any possible sexual partners other than caliban who's portrayed as you know pretty i mean he's possibly a piece of shit possibly just an oppressed person possibly uh the son of an evil witch and so needs to be kept on you know under wraps so that he doesn't develop the same habits as his mother you know he's kind of an ambiguous character in a lot of respects but he's the only possible sexual partner other than her father that she could have had and so she it, she's more saying something about how like the perfect state of uh nobility and potential monarchy for women in this society was one of like almost perfect virginal uh, uh naivety for for lack of a better term i mean i believe uh, elizabeth was the queen at, at, or the or the soon-to-be queen at the time this was written and the colony of virginia was partially named like in reference to her ongoing virginity and it's importance in terms of you know england's uh future prosperity and alliance securement and things like that so you know this was 
very it was very important to them in a way it really can't be for us and so miranda comes across as a much flatter character i think to a modern reader than you know she like she she might have carried a certain symbolic resonance to the original watchers or hearers you know people at this time they said let's go hear a play let's not 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 let's go watch a play uh you know the, the she there was a resonance that she might have had to contemporaneous uh viewers slash listeners that she really can't have to uh, uh someone reading or watching this in the modern day except for the fact that she has the other most famous line from this play which is oh brave new world that has such people in it yeah uh maybe we could talk about uh calvin here to to connect it to a uh, miranda so uh, one thing that i f so like first of all there there is a um you know there's like a disagreement uh, among uh, Shakespeare scholars as to whether or not we could say definitively that there was an attempted rape of Miranda by Caliban. Now, I don't know to what extent this is just kind of like, you know, post-colonial theory trying to rehabilitate, uh, you know, Caliban's uh, legacy. Like like one thing that I was, uh, one thing in my edition, they have excerpts of, um, uh, I'm not sure exactly how to pronounce his name, Amy uh, Cesar's uh like rendition against the of the tempest which the excerpt of it is actually pretty bad uh but you know caliban there for instance is presented very much as you know someone that is uh misunderstood someone that is put into like a, a dire situation but let's leave aside whether or not uh the rape in fact occurred let's just kind of like you know for the sake of argument can see that it happened um but it's still it's interesting to just discuss kind of like the surroundings like when it comes to Miranda's uh, virginity, one thing that I found fascinating is how later on in the play, when Prospero is starting to soften towards Ferdinand, who is uh, the the suitor of uh, Miranda, who himself is, what is he? Is he the son of uh, Alonzo? Is that what it is, or the, not, not the son of Antonio? I don't think, but um, but yeah, it must be the son. Uh, of yeah, Alonso. Ferdinand is the son of, is the son of Alonzo, who is the king yeah. of Naples. Yeah, so uh, Ferdinand, son of Alonzo, uh, he, you know, he's uh, one of the people that are shipwrecked, and uh, he's wandering around. Eventually, he comes across for a uh, uh, prosper Miranda, falls in love with Miranda. Miranda falls in love with Ferdinand, and uh, after uh, Prosper softens and basically says, like, okay, you could marry her. He's very uh, adamant and very explicit about you have to make sure that um, when you guys, you know, when you guys have sex, like it can only be after marriage it cannot be before marriage he doesn't use the same language that he uses in in reference to caliban which was uh violate my daughter's honor but uh he does say something like you know if you you know if you break you know the uh, the the marital knot or something beforehand the kinds of you know plagues that he calls upon both miranda and ferdinand is very similar to the plagues that he calls towards caliban it seems every single night like tonight you will have cramps right he's constantly like you know telling caliban that you know he's gonna uh, summon this or that indignity and physical you know uh, impairment upon him and he's doing a similar thing here right if there's going to be this and but he's not talking about rape in that case right he's talking about consensual sex between ferdinand yeah. and miranda oh virginity was serious geopolitical business at that time yeah. man. i mean people no, no nobles would marry their children off to one another and there would be huge numbers of people that went into the bridal chamber at, at you know after the first night of marriage to check if there was mm -hmm. blood on the sheet i mean yeah. if there wasn't like a, a, a whole like trade agreements and military alliances could fall apart if there was any sense of like perfidy or deception on the part of uh of a noble woman or uh or, or a female member of the royal family so it was serious fucking business at the time uh and, and imagine how like it, crazy it is like th things get so um you know warped in those ways that you know like like men like it to me, it's just kind of it's totally insane mm -hmm. to me that as a male you would ever want to marry a virgin, but you know I, I guess given you know certain kind of circumstances like that, you know it's uh, it's kind of like know, that's a, that's a lot right. easier to say in the age of antibiotics. Yeah, you exactly. Know? <laughs> it's a lot easier yeah. to say in the age of uh, antifungal creams. Yeah, you know? it's so. it, it is interesting how these things could like shift so 
dramatic and seems like so dramatically against you know biological imperatives like you could definitely you know uh construct a just so story and it's not just a just so story like you there's a lot of credibility to it as to why you want to marry a virgin as opposed to you know uh, the alternatives but um you know like you change around some circumstances you you know uh whatever like now it's like ooh, you know i i i, ne I never like the, the the only men left that are like really kind of fetishizing like yeah yeah i want to marry a virgin it's like the creepiest and you know the the type of men that normally wouldn't you know uh, have women in the first place but anyway um yeah. so so like yeah but it is kind of interesting how like you know putting all that aside like it you know there's still the discussion of consensual sex is given with the same exact penalties as non-consensual sex right mm -hmm. it's the same kind of set of penalties it's the same like pestilence that will have to infect you it's this is that um it's not just about you know uh whether or not my daughter feels happy in a situation right it's not merely about whether or not her honor is being violated you know a lot of it just goes down to you know property rights extension of property women being you know in a sense property in that way so you know to just put like a little bit you know not even to like uh deny whether or not rape uh, uh, an attempted rape occurred but just to complicate th that sort of a reading you know there's that little aspect to it there's also the fact that i mean we could totally put aside you know um any uh, uh questions of uh like the fact of the matter and simply still have to deal with the fact that hey look you know whatever in fact transpired or didn't transpire even if we concede everything the bottom the bottom line is in this situation we're simply getting the rendition of events as presented by the victor right as presented by the one that is able to write the history as presented by someone who has a lot of a uh, uh, a natural almost uh, inhuman power like um there was this one like when the whole kind of when the comedic when the comedic conspiracy emerges like between caliban and and his new friends uh mm -hmm. th this is how it, it was phrased um remember first to possess his books for without them he's but a a sot as i am right this idea that if you the second that you take away books or rationality or the or these you know trappings of things that make a human being a human being but you know animals obviously they have you know they have nothing to do with books right they don't it's not it's something that's within their can but for human beings once you have these trappings of all this additional stuff that people could do that's the thing that really makes you human and with these kinds of powers right he's going to be the one that writes all this even in the discussion between prospero and ariel as far as like okay sycorax which is caliban's mom uh she was in this um you know she was in this island and she trapped you in this cloven pine for uh it seemed like it was less than 12 years because she died when when he was in it um and he was just essentially left there until prospero uh, came back that story is still told by Pro prospero and he uses it as a cudgel against ariel he's like you forgot what happened to you didn't you forgot how i found you you forgot you forgot ariel says no i didn't and then he speaks for ariel this is what happened this is how i found you right he's obsessed you know as um as a kind of like literati or whatever you want to call it magician whatever right intellectual you know he's obsessed with constructing that story sycorax we don't know anything about her other than what prospero says and what ariel doesn't even say what he like assents to with a nod or with like a word or two and that's not to say that you know Sycorax wasn't a total piece of shit I mean maybe she really was um but the point is whatever the facts of the matter are still they are being written by the victor in this island right and th that's definitely something um uh, to keep in mind yeah the you know the other thing that I would say is I, the post-colonial reading of this play sort of gets me a little bit because mm -hmm. unless they somehow got so lost that they went through the Strait of fucking Gibraltar, they are clearly on an island in the Mediterranean Sea. You know, they went from Naples to Tunis to marry Alonso's daughter to the king of Tunis, which is in Tunisia, which is in the northeast part of Africa, which is- And Sikrax is from Algiers. Sea. Yeah, and yeah, and and Sycorax is from Algeria. Um, so so clearly this is not in the New World. I guess this could be an island off the coast of Africa, in which case there's sort of a, a post-colonial reading, but Algeria was controlled. I, I mean, assuming that this takes place 
maybe somewhere in the 1500s, you know, talking about the 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 grand time of Italian city-states and the King of Naples and the Duke of Milan being really, really important people, you know, uh, or the 1600s when or, when, or the early 1600s when it's thought to have been, the play is thought to have been written, you know. Um, I, I mean, this is really, like, there's something weird going on, actually, with, because, I, I mean, it does sort of, it, it, it's weird, because if somebody didn't bring it up, you could be easily forgiven for not catching it, but once it's made, you're made aware, like, there is something here about, like, the early days of colonization, and inhabitants of the new world but it's weird because there's also i mean algeria was an islamic uh principality at the time you know it was my, my, this was before the french colonization of algeria it was controlled by it was controlled by muslims at the time that that this was written there's only a few centuries after the muslims were expelled from spain and mo the ones that were expelled from spain they mostly went to north africa as far as i know uh and algeria would have been one of those places and it said that sycorax was causing a lot of problems in algiers and was expelled from there but she had rendered some kind of service or done something that they chose not to kill her. They chose just to banish her. So, I mean, this well, is... Yeah, well, well uh, the, um, what, what, the official position, I think, of Shakespearean scholarship is uh, it's because that she was pregnant, so she was spared the death penalty and says so she was banished. It was a common thing at the time that women yeah. to avoid, you know, prison sentences, they would get pregnant. But at the same time, you know, I, I, I heard that prior to even like reading, reading of the Tempest, but when you actually do read the Tempest, you're right that it's actually not, you know, you can't make that deduction. Oh, a hundred percent. This is what's being said. So it does yeah. actually sound like she might've done something, um, you know, for them, like depending on how you, you, you parse that language. Right. So, uh, what, like all the official pronouncements about this, I, I don't think you could necessarily accept them as like, th this is, it's, it's all yeah. in reference to her pregnancy. Yeah. And it's weird because like magic at the time, like in, in this era, I, I mean, magic means a lot of things in a lot of different times and places, but it was sort of understood as, uh, a, a continued, usage or a sense of honor or fealty to like pagan rituals like pre-christian pagan rituals and yet the 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 dark magic here is coming from uh, uh what was at the time like a muslim principality and so and it's banished to an island in the mediterranean between north africa and italy and the but but prospero comes and he's also doing magic but his magic is like good for some reason like uh, he he sees like the like the dark magic from the from the muslim principality sees the 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 control of nature that some some that's uh that ariel represents and cannot harness it uh but the good person from europe comes to the island and is able to free ariel and is able to harness the power of Ariel to his own ends. And to, so, so, so I, again, this is kind of why I keep coming back to, cause there's something here about like, cause it, it, I would imagine like, it wasn't totally unknown to Europeans that during the period that we call the dark ages, the Islamic world was experiencing like a great flowering of arts and literature and science and that they were, you know, sort of the, 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 the grand tradition of Rome uh, continued in the Islamicate world. You know, it, was, it, it, it wasn't it was like there was just a period of almost a thousand years where there was no accomplishment whatsoever. It just wasn't happening in Europe specifically. The, and, and even then, that's not entirely true, but, you know, it's, it's closer to the truth. And so there's something about here about like like Shakespeare almost recognizing maybe intuitively maybe implicitly like there is some there was some kind of ball that was that was dropped like some sort of uh, 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 of possibility uh, of wisdom and enrichment and power that was dropped in the Muslim world that now we uh, you know we we hear in this you know er, early modern. Uh, you know, verging on something great, uh, Euro European Christendom, you know, we have the potential to pick up on, but we can't be 
seduced by it and we can't let it be like the crux of our rule i mean there there, there is the, the and may, and i think this is almost the, the the this is part of what makes the whole new world colonial post-colonial reading whatever viable is that there is clearly something on the horizon that shakespeare gets on like a like like a, almost like a like a goosebump deep level or something like mm -hmm. that. You know, there's like something that he is recognizing the beginnings of that is just like starting to percolate in his time period that he can't quite articulate or he can't quite, like he can only sort of find these like bits and bobs, you know, and sort of put them together into this sort of, uh, you know, sort of allegorical or parable or whatever you want to call it. Uh, fable almost the you know about this this duke that's been exiled to this island and sort of left to fester in his own uh studiousness uh and, and has to spend 12 years thinking about like what that actually means and what kind of a ruler he really wants to mean but you know he can't he can't quite articulate it it's all sort of discombobulated and 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 strewn throughout various parts of the text and uh you know, it's one of those things where if you want to invoke Leonard Schlein's art and physics, right, the idea that artists see ahead uh, of even like, you know, physical facts, scientific facts, other kinds of facts, historical facts, you know, there is like something about, you know, the whole kind of Algiers connection, right? Uh, Algeria being something that has become very much just like a total symbol, right, in many respects of, uh, you know, like post-colonial struggle, decolonization, Right. We in terrorism, we talk about things like the, you know, the the uh, uh, Algeria model, right, uh, of decolonization, that sort of thing. And, you know, here it is playing a prominent role uh, to your point about, you know, these Muslims are practicing what seems to be black magic. Prospero is is practicing white magic, which is permissible. One thing that I do appreciate about the play is how even if that's, in fact, the case, uh that idea seems to be critiqued as well in the play, right? Hmm. Like, you know, Prospero does ultimately give up his magic. And part of this might be, you know, um, in terms of psychoanalysis, right? If Prospero recognizes within himself that, you know what, I am very much like an absent mind professor type. And this thing is kind of like, you know, like here I am, I'm, I'm regressing further and further into childhood, right? Here I am like alone in this island or mostly alone. And I just essentially do whatever I want. I could, you know, be a tyrant to whomever I want. Um, and, you know, psychoanalytically, maybe he wants to like transcend that and kind of like, you know, finally become an adult and whatnot, you know, give away his, his daughter and not, you know, claim ownership of her any longer. Um, but on the other level, right, uh, there, there's still, you know, something to be said for the idea that, you know, magic in general, uh, if it's a standard for tyranny, if it's a standard for something else, and you know, something about that is inapplicable to the modern world. Like even even Gonzalo, right, who's presented as he he's originally the one who uh so like this this ship that they get uh, outfitted on um as they get exiled uh, essentially from uh from uh, uh from Naples or from uh or from Milan, um it seems like it, the ship was built uh, specifically for the purpose of getting them to be shipwrecked and dying along the way. Uh, it seemed to be like a death sentence for Miranda and Prospero to be sent away. And instead, Gonzalo comes out in the last minute. He gives him food. He gives him, you know, uh, some of his most valued books, which means his magic. And when Gonzalo finally speaks and he has like an extended dialogue about maybe some sort of ideal model for government – uh, which he takes, like, you know, maybe we could establish some, some, something like this uh, on this island. It's very, uh, very much like, you know, it's it's like very like noble savage in many respects, right? It's this uh, utopian sort of, a, sort of ideal that I can't imagine, you know, Shakespeare writing it and not, you know, just kind of like laughing at like the silliness of these projections, right? Um, and so like in, in many ways, like the island does become this thing where, you regress further and further into your own head, away from reality. And here Gonzalo is sort of constructing uh, exactly what this uh, uh, unattain unattainable utopian vision would look like. And magic is the thing that would get us somewhere where human beings ought not to go. So, you know, that is another kind of like wrinkle to all of this. You know, Prospero does give up his magic. Um, he, in a sense, like kind of like at the end, like is he actually admitting 
in a sense, to some sort of moral equality to the practices of sicker acts versus what he might do. Maybe not, you know, uh, in uh, specifically as he's doing these actions, but in the long term, if this is how people think it's acceptable uh, to behave, whether it's with magic or tyranny, like you might as well be a sicker acts. You might as well be uh, a, a Caliban. So, mm -hmm. well, you know, it's it's telling that later, I, I, after Shakespeare's death, and this is, I, 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 it's one of the 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 great shames that you couldn't like cryogenically freeze Shakespeare and then like put him in the time where Thomas Hobbes lived, like through the English Civil War and all of the sort of treachery and fraught questions about sovereignty uh, that were really provoked by that particular uh, conflict, because I, I do think he would probably have a lot of interesting insights into something like that. But during that period is when you saw uh, the levelers and the diggers emerge in England, which were basically sort of proto-Christian socialist type of movements that sort of took the 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 overthrow of the monarchy very seriously and said, not only is the monarchy not particularly justifiable, but any form of property that puts one man above another and denies their sort of equal status before the eyes of God uh, is, uh, is, uh, is an unjust tyranny. And these were both, and, and the, the reason I bring this up is because you have to imagine that something like that, that asserts itself enough to be remarked upon by history as those did there must have been like rumblings of that like on the streets in shakespeare even if it was just like people grumbling like you know these these noble fucks you know the they they think you know they think they can just make us work all the time and you know they're like none of us have to do any of this you know there's enough to go around you know and shakespeare would have heard stuff like that and been like okay so because he even makes fun of it in the play like it's not just that he would have been laughing to himself like it, at one point as gonzalo is describing this utopia where nobody has to work and where the land just sort of magically produces enough plenty for everybody such that nobody has to work nobody has to engage in trade or contracts or anything with you know one of the people just like one of the people hearing this just turns basically to the audience and says and he would be the king of this implying mm -hmm. not only that this would be unworthy to be king of but also like how are you the king if this is how it like like in what like like how would the idea of sovereignty even function if there's like nothing if there's no layers of society that you are sovereign over and coordinating and integrating into a coherent whole you know so the this idea i mean you know it's it's in some ways a beautiful idea you know i'm i i i still call myself a, you know a socialist or whatever in, in in this day and age but even i don't think that socialism means no work you know i mean i my i i'm sort of i'm sort of on the no no private property train but i'm certainly not on the no work train so you know so and and even you know the the idea of like you know the abolition of property or whatever would have seemed like you know hopelessly naive in shakespeare's time and possibly still even does today i mean certain things are just sort of a a, a hope and a wish no matter what time period you hold on to them so well, yeah I can is... yeah go ahead no no go ahead go ahead yeah, I can imagine a socialism with difficulties, right? One thing as I get older is uh, it does become more and more apparent, right? Like um, you really do need, you know, waves, right? Uh, uh, to like rock your ship, right? Um, you know, in so many respects, like what Nietzsche says about difficulties in life actually being the thing that allows, you know, anything of value to come about. I mean, that, that is, th there's a lot of truth to that, right? I think any kind of like utopian society there still needs to be something in place where, you know, difficulties just come at you quick and hard. It's just that the kinds of difficulties that we're talking about need to change, right? When I well, say that's, difficult, that's, even, what, yeah. that's neurologically true as well. Yeah. There's, there, there's been like neuropsychological uh, and neuropsychiatric study that have shown that there is like a Goldilocks zone of stress mm -hmm. where if you have too little exposure to stress and hardship, then you become totally emotionally dysregulated when you get older and you're unable to really handle any sort of 
disruption to whatever the equilibrium of your life is. But if you're exposed to too much, then you basically just sort of become flat and unresponsive and, you know, too accepting and like fatalistically and not emotionally and behaviorally dynamic enough to to, to really function in the world. So there is sort mm -hmm. of a there, there, there is an optimum of difficulty that any sort of utopian society would have to factor into its calculation in order for that utopia to be sustained in per perpetuity. Maybe we can move to uh, Caliban's first like famous speech uh, after uh, he confront confronts uh, Prospero. So, um, you know, as Caliban is uh, you know being summoned, right? He's always summoned by Prospero with all these like different kinds of uh, uh, insults, right? Like, you know, like, you know, we have to wait for the devil to come up, right? We, and, and so mm -hmm. on and so forth. So, a uh, Caliban starts to speak to Prospero, enter Caliban. As wicked do as ever my mother brushed with raven's feather from unwholesome fen, drop on you both, a southwest blow on ye and blister you all over. And Prospero says, for this be sure tonight thou shalt have cramps, side stitches that shall tend thy breath up, urchins shall forth at vast of the night that they may work all exercise on thee thou shalt be pinched as thick as honeycomb each pinch more stinging than bees that made them so first of all like whatever that we might say about uh the justice of you know just punishing caliban for let's just again for the sake of argument concede that there is some sort of you know violation that he attempted upon miranda um you're, you're you then start, start to ask yourself like well what exactly is the punishment that's appropriate because are you just going to like literally torture him every single day because it seems to be that's what's happening right there's going to be cramps there's going to be urchins there's going to be you know all this stuff happening which by the way like later on when we talk about it, it is fascinating that caliban gets specifically this treatment from prospero and yet at the end of the play the way that prospero wins back his power is he casts a spell upon uh, the conspirators and upon you know alonzo and upon antonio where the the purpose of the spell is to just like take their native irrationality out of their heads and now they become totally you know rational actors in the kind of you know enlightenment sense of like you know bringing forward some sort of more perfect society and when they finally understand oh we acted so irrationally against you know against prospero silly us now we can move on with our lives you know, Caliban never gets that, right? And he seems to be treating these conspirators better than he treats Caliban, despite the fact that as far as, you know, we're concerned objectively, um, what ends up happening is like they are, your know, Prosper is sent away in a boat with Miranda meant to drown and die, right? In very kind of dire circumstances. And at the very least, wouldn't that require the same sort of punishment that you inflict upon Caliban? Why are they getting such a different, you know, set of standards? So anyway, Caliban's response to all this is, I must eat my dinner. This island's mine by Sycorax, my mother, which thou takest from me. When thou camest first, thou strokest me and made much of me, wouldst give me water with berries in it, and teach me how to name the bigger light and how the less that burn by day and night. And then I loved thee and showed thee all the qualities of the isle, the fresh springs, brine pits, barren place, and fertile. Cursed I be that did so. All the charms of Sycorax, toads, beetles, bats, light on you. For I am all the subjects that you have, which first was mine own king. And here you sty me in this hard rock, whilst you do keep from me the rest of the island. And maybe uh, before we transition to the patron show, we could just, in the public show, just... Uh, uh finish our discussion with this with this and you know what it reveals if anything because to me the first thing i think is well it seems as if at the beginning uh by by his own telling and also by the uh, ascent of prospero that they had a kind of like positive healthy relationship in some ways at least right i don't know exactly what the specifics might have been and something like that right you essentially come across it would be something like a wolf child or whatever you want to call it right somebody without a language somebody that has to be taught how to be a human being and it's not even you know clear that this is totally a human being right the idea is you know he was um you know uh he doesn't have a human shape right that's how he's discussed um mm -hmm. but it seems like of everything that prospero might have taught right including language and whatever 
uh, maybe it's just simply true that Prospero never bothered to teach Caliban, uh, you know, sexual ethics. What is appropriate and not appropriate? Because, you know, he's never seen any. He says, I've never seen a woman other than my mother and Miranda. And he recognizes right away that Miranda is, you know, physically a superior specimen, more desirable than his mother, that sort of thing. Um, and that, I, I think it is kind of interesting that uh, if he is able to act ethically, if he's not simply the evil spawn of an evil witch, uh, it is kind of telling that of all the things that could, he could have been taught and is taught, he's not really taught sexual ethics. Like I, I, I don't believe that he could have been ethical in every single regard. But this is the one thing that he cannot be ethical with. There must be some, you know, something that's missing, right? Maybe something that's not taught, right? Maybe uh, something else is happening. Maybe Prospero thought, you know, he has no need for these lessons. Or maybe he can't imagine ever giving his daughter to somebody like a Caliban. So why even have this discussion? Um, so, like, what do you think about that and, and this uh, speech that he has? Well, it, you know, it's interesting because Caliban never really gets the Shylock moment in this play. You know, mm -hmm. he never, I mean, Shylock is for most of the the merchant of Venice, it's, he is a pretty anti-Semitic caricature in most respects. You know, this Jewish man who only cares about his money and, and, and you know, thirsts for the blood of the good Christians or whatever, but he gets one speech where he basically lays it out and says, look, you guys treat us like absolute shit. So of course I don't have much regard uh, for your, for your well being. Of course I value my money and my wealth more than you, because what have you ever done for me that would lead me to value anything else? You know? Uh, so, so he, he gets a memorable moment of, uh, if not, you know, an excuse for the evil behavior he engages in, at least kind of an explanation. And Caliban never really gets that. This is, I guess, the closest where he says, I was my own king. You, you know, I trusted you. You taught me. I, I, I liked you. And now look at what you're doing to me. And Prospero says, well, you tried to violate. He doesn't say, you know, it is interesting. He doesn't say you tried to rape my daughter. He does say mm -hmm. you tried to violate the honor of my daughter. And he says, would that I had done it. So, I mean, I guess I could sort of see the crack there through which like Ami Césaire or whoever could be like, uh, oh, maybe this wasn't, you know, a, like an evil defilement of, you know, uh, of royal chastity. Maybe this was, I mean, these were the, the only two people that each the other knew on the island. You know, maybe there was something more, consensual here that was not under you know that prospero wasn't even capable of acknowledging or maybe you know but i i mean i think probably when shakespeare wrote it he would have understood that like even if even if miranda had wanted it the very fact of caliban pursuing it like in the same way that we say it still is statutory rape even if the the younger person wants it uh, from from the older person at the time that they that they have sex. I mean, this would still be seen as sort of a form of rape, even if it was purely consensual on Miranda's part, because part of sexual ethics at the time that this was would, was written was you know staying within your own class boundaries. Basically, you know, the class was never as strict as caste was in India in Europe, but it certainly was an important part of uh, sexual uh, and familial ethics at the time. And so there is this sort of sense whereby Caliban has violated something very deeply to the, to the point where he is basically and any sort of torture or like a uh, program of constant indenturement, constant servitude, constant enslavement basically is framed as functionally okay on Prospero's part because he never gets any regests really like is he Ariel is freed at the end of the play I don't think Caliban is freed is no, he? Uh, just, well well uh, yeah Caliban, well yeah Caliban is freed in the sense that he's allowed and, and he's made to go. realize that he should have never like you know I he basically says I feel stupid forever giving my allegiance to these drunken louts in the first yeah place. You yeah. Know, but yeah, he, he, yeah. There's, there's, there's no spell that's cast upon him to make him see reason, right? He's kind of like 
you know, maybe he learns reason through like negative experiences. But yeah. if anything, he's presented somebody like, oh, okay, okay, I could now escape this and I'm just going to take what I could get and I'm just going to leave and, you know, never, never look back. Right. In that you know, regard. It's funny because the historical like early colonizers uh, of the Americas, you know, they in general were a heck of a lot more like, uh, Oh God! Uh, what are the two Trunculo and what's the other one? Uh, you know, they 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 tended to be a lot more the uh, the irredeemable drunken lout than they did the uh, wise uh, administrator like uh, like Prospero. You know, somebody like Cortez was. You know, the the conquistadors, for example, were more. Uh, like second sons that had not inherited property or like the fail son, you know, they, they to use the chapel term, they were more like fail sons than they were, uh, you know, brave conquerors or whatever, you know, so the, 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 there was something at the time where and the, and Europeans even recognize like the people that are going to go to the colonies and like do all this shit to these native people like what what losers these are you know like like what must be missing in you that this is that you think that this is like a good use of your time and energies to go inflict this on the native population i mean he uh, he was bullshitting his way a lot it, through this but bartolome de las casas you know he was writing in the 1500s about the horrors that had been unleashed onto the indigenous people by the spaniards and even if it was like a moralistic exaggeration of what had happened in order to sort of get attention and and you know bring a swifter end to what was happening it's clearly you know it's clearly directionally right you know mm -hmm. it's clearly directionally right in terms of what was happening and yet and Shakespeare seems to have read some of this stuff. Like there's been, I, I, I was doing some, you know, to, I, I'm going to say research, but really just sort of looking through the Wikipedia article and various like, you know, re scholarly links that, you know, you can find on there. But I mean, you know, it covers a lot of uh, time and space in different fields that, I mean, I, that have been uh, addressed by this. And, and also, I mean, I've looked this stuff up on my own over the years it just had been a while since i thought about this play so i wanted to refresh her and you know one thing that comes up again and again is like these sort of travelogues or, or, or and things that had been coming out of early colonization out of early uh sailing trips to africa and america and things like that like there are tiny micro references throughout shakespeare's work that suggest that he was uh, at least aware of this stuff, if not reading it himself, mm -hmm. you know? So, I mean, he could have been, you know, he, it just, it sort of seems to me that he really could have treated Caliban a lot more sympathetically. And yet he, you know, it, like the most sympathetic reading that he gets is that he can recognize, you know, the, the rightness of his own subjugation and not, partner with these lower class louts to try and overthrow the established order you know that, that he's also that he's also given like harder not you know, to recognize the the rightness of the hierarchy in which he is embedded he's also given like a human aspect right in the sense of like i mean there's this speech right where he's just kind of like demanding i guess a kind of dignity and in some ways i guess a shylock also does but uh i mean near the end right uh, when he's talking about you know uh the the mysteriousness of the island right and 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 the sounds and you know these are the kinds of fixations that human beings would have um and i, I think he's, he's definitely he's he's humanized at least in the sense that uh you could recognize your same intellectual faculties and your same curiosities within him right mm -hmm. that you would have within yourself uh, i actually want to uh, mention uh some more stuff about shylock from merchant of venice um for the the patron show actually and the connection to to the tempest so for those that have been watching publicly the public show thank you and if you guys want to be patrons that's patreon.com slash automachination i did say like two months ago i was going to set up the the youtube uh join program membership and i never did that but i i'm gonna i'm gonna get to it so people that don't do patreon but instead you prefer like youtube memberships you could also get um Maybe not all the same videos, but most of them. There's some stuff that I can't even put on YouTube uh, unlisted, right? Uh, I can't even give you uh, the unlisted link. So some of that stuff would have to be uh, paywall behind Patreon. But 
from our YouTube members. Uh, I'll, I'll set something up uh, soon as well. And we're going to also talk about the patron show. Uh, so we're going to finish the Tempest. I mean, if we have anything else that we want to talk about in terms of current events or or uh, other ideas we might have after the discussion, whatever that's going to be, you will find in the show notes now. So if you just look at the uh, information below the video, the pinned comment or the video description, you'll get a list of B-side topics to see if they are of sufficient interest for you. So public viewers, thank you for watching. Thank you for being subscribers. And the patron show starts now.